Hi, this is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining me for this week's episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. And today, I'm going to give you the top 10 reasons your mix sucks, or at least why you feel it sucks. Let's be honest. We have all, at some point or another, felt like our mix has sucked for one reason or another. And sometimes our mixes actually do suck. But the good news is, these are the 10 most common reasons you're feeling like your mix sucks. And if your mix actually does suck, correcting one of these issues is going to make it suck a whole lot less. I've structured it so these reasons get better and better as they go along. But we're going to start off good. Let's get right into it. The only thing I have to do before I give you reason number one that you might feel like your current mix sucks or why it might actually suck, the only thing I got to do to keep this podcast alive is do a quick shout out to our sponsors, the biggest and most important sponsor as always being you. How do you sponsor this podcast? Hit the like button if you're on the YouTube version of this podcast. Consider giving us a five-star rating and review if you're on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, something like that. But the best way to sponsor this podcast, as always, is to sponsor yourself. Try out one of our great full-length courses like the new Compression Breakthroughs that will change the way you hear and use compression forever for the better. We go super deep on compressing every single instrument in that course. I think you're absolutely going to love it, and there's a money-back guarantee. If you want a full system for mixing, check out Mixing Breakthroughs, or if you want to learn everything that I know about mastering, which is what I do day in and day out for my audio work these days, check that out over at MasteringDemystified.com. Quick shout out to our brand sponsors for this week, Sound Toys, sponsoring this podcast from the beginning, making some of my favorite creative mixing effects in the known universe. Also, Isotope. If you go over to isotope.com slash sonic scoop, you can get 10% off any of the plugins that Isotope makes or a 30-day free trial instead of the normal seven-day free trial on their Music Production Suite Pro Bundle. I use at least some of the Isotope modules on basically every single master I do. They make incredible stuff. Also, a new sponsor for this week, super interesting, a brand called GPU Audio. You might know your computer has a CPU inside of it. It also has a GPU inside of it. Unless you're like Bitcoin mining or playing crazy video games, chances are you're not doing that much with it. And it's an untapped resource for processing more audio. And GPU Audio has a great way of doing it. You can get early access for free to their super fast convolution reverb powered by the GPU that's already there in your computer sitting dormant on basically all of your sessions. And if you go to gpu.audio slash sonic scoop, you can get early access to their super fast convolution reverb. You'll definitely want to check that out. You've got untapped resources in your computer whenever you're working in your DAW, so don't let them go to waste. Completely free to try out. Enjoy. All right, with that out of the way, let's get into the meat of this week's episode. Number one reason why your mix might suck is, I hate to say it, but you suck. (laughs) You suck at mixing. And that's honestly a reason we just have to get out of the way first. But I don't want this to sound harsh because this is actually okay. This is actually an awesome reason to have your mix suck. The fact that you just haven't mixed enough yet And this is a stage that we all go through. So if you're going through a period where you're like, man, my mixes just suck. I can't get them to sound good enough. I can't get them to sound good as my favorite releases that are being produced and engineered and performed and mixed by people who have been doing this for years upon years, and in some cases, decades or more, like that's okay. You have a lifetime of improving at mixing, music production, songwriting, arrangement, just getting progressively better better at it ahead of you. That's awesome. You are going to continue to see improvements as you go forward. Learning to mix well does not happen overnight. So if you feel like your results aren't as good as they could be, you know what? There's a chance that they're not, and that's totally okay. In fact, the very reality that you're being so critical of yourself right now shows that you have taste, you have standards, you have a vision for where your stuff should end up, and you're actually looking and listening objectively to where your mixes are and comparing them to where you want them to wind up. That is the first step towards greatness, and it is a step that a lot of people leave out. They're too afraid to compare where their mixes are now to the sound of some of their favorite records. And because they don't make those comparisons, because they don't go through that discomfort of embracing the fact that they suck right now, they don't get better. They don't improve. And the very fact that you're frustrated with yourself and you're critical of yourself, 
That's the ammunition that you're going to need to improve going forward. And the very fact that you feel that way, that almost anger you have at your mix or at yourself or your tools for not being good enough, sometimes it's misdirected anger, but that anger you have, it's like a fuel. It's like a fire that can help you get better. Now, I'm not saying you should be in this negative, angry, self-hating state all the time because too much of that can keep you back from improving as well. But let's get that out of the way. There is this reason, number one, you just haven't been at long enough. That's okay. Keep at it. Keep applying yourself. Keep learning. Keep, hopefully, listening to the Sonic Two podcast. And you will improve. You will get better by learning good ideas and putting them into practice. All right. Reason number two, and this is a really material one that you can work on right now, and that's that your monitoring sucks. That's why your mix sucks. And let me clarify this a little bit, because it's not just your monitoring sucks. It also could be you just haven't learned your monitoring. So there's two ways to look at this. So let me just get the whole idea of monitoring out of the way. What you're hearing, whether it's through headphones, through speakers, in your room, the actual room environment you're in, that's part of your monitoring situation, there's a chance you're actually making good aesthetic decisions about how your mix should turn out, but those decisions aren't translating to other environments because your monitoring sucks. What you're hearing isn't really what's happening. And if you can't really hear what's going on in your mix in an honest way, it becomes so much more difficult to make good choices. And you can't just trust yourself to be creative and make good decisions if you can't trust what you're hearing. And I want to clarify this one because there's two ways to go about fixing this problem. One is to fix your monitoring. And that's a good solution. That includes good speakers, potentially. If you're using speakers, good room treatment. Huge part of the component of monitoring is not just your speakers, but your speaker and room environment. Maybe it involves a little bit of EQ correction. So rather than maxing out on any one of those three, you kind of spread your available resources across all of those three. Or if you're in headphones, I'm not one of these people who's going to tell you, you can't do good mixes in headphones because you actually can. And I even know of very good mastering engineers namely Glenn Schick, who at a super high level are mastering entire records, got major labels on nothing but headphones and a laptop. So you can also do this stuff in headphones. And to be honest, if you have the same amount of money to invest in headphones versus room, speaker, EQ environment, you'll get closer to the top of the line in headphones faster than you will for the same amount of money spent in speakers and room and that kind of stuff. So that's one thing. Improve your monitoring. But the other big thing is learning your monitoring. So there's two things here. One, you can improve your monitoring. Two, you can learn it. And honestly, both is best. Because even if you have great monitoring that really gives you a clear picture of what's actually happening in your record, you still have to learn even that. I will tell you that good monitoring is easier to learn than bad monitoring in part because you're not going to like go back six inches in your chair and the low frequencies totally change, which is a problem in untreated rooms with poorly placed speakers. And if you have more accurate monitoring, you're not going to have to overcompensate for idiosyncrasies in your monitoring system. So working on improving your monitoring makes your monitoring easier to learn. But I also know of people who have done amazing sounding mixes on compromised monitors in compromised monitoring environments just by learning their monitoring. And the way you do that is by checking the work you've done in a lot of other environments and by listening to commercial references, your favorite releases in your environment again and again and again so you know exactly what they sound like. I'll give you a quick example. I hate Sony MDR7506 headphones. Sony make other good stuff. Those particular headphones, some of the most popular headphones in the pro audio world for decades. I personally hate them. They sound too brash, too bright, too annoying, completely skewed frequency response. But I know some people who get great results by using those as a supplementary check, and they just know what those headphones sound like because they've listened to so many records on them, and they know that to make records sound good in those headphones, they got to make them sound too bright, too brash, too annoying, and really skewed in frequency response, but they just know what they're supposed to sound like. So they do that and they're okay. So you can learn even really, really bad monitors. It's just a little bit harder. All right. Reason number three, your mix sucks is another structural one, another big picture one. 
We'll get more into specifics in just a minute about like actual things you might be doing wrong in the mix, but this is another big picture one, and it is that you are spending too long on your mix. And related to this is that you probably don't have a system for mixing. If you get this part of your mixing process cleaned up, you're going to find your results improve significantly. And so many of the worst mistakes in mixing come at the 11th hour. You've done 80, 90% of your mix, and now you start second guessing and backtracking on all these decisions you made earlier on in the process because you're losing perspective. And this is increasingly likely to happen on mixes where you've been working on it for a few days or heavens forbid, a few weeks or even a few months, or some people spend even longer than that. I know people have worked on certain mixes for a few years without making them get substantially better and often just chasing their own tails. It is possible to mix faster than you are now. And so many of the greatest mixers working today will complete their mixes in something like four hours or eight hours. Now, granted, this might not include setup time. Some of these great mixers may have someone else doing some of the session setup before they even get into mixing so they can really focus on being creative. If you feel like at this point in your career or your hobby or your craft as a mixer that you can't warrant having an assistant to set up things for you, I get it. But you can treat yourself like your own assistant. First, set everything up. Get the technical stuff out of the way first before you move a single knob or fader or make a single mix decision. And then you can focus just on the creative stuff. Because one of the biggest problems that makes mixing take longer than it should and gets you out of creative mindset and into hypercritical, second-guessing, overly analytical mindset is switching back and forth again and again and again between creative mind and technical mind, technical mind and creative mind. The more of those switches you have, the longer your mix is going to take and the more that you're going to lose perspective. So I'd really recommend getting a system in place for mixing. Part of this involves having a mix template, not meaning that you're going to apply the exact same EQ and reverb and compression settings every single time, but just having the structure of your mix set up before you start working on it. But also having an order of operations, a repeatable process in which you navigate your way through the mix, having a roadmap to mixing can really help, especially in the beginning and intermediate phases. It can help to have a concrete roadmap. And that's what we really focus on in the course, Mixing Breakthroughs. Yes, shameless plug, because I really believe that if you can square this part of what you're doing away completely and get that under control, having a system for mixing, your quality of mixes is going to go up significantly while your time to complete them goes down. Is that possible? Absolutely is possible. We've had thousands of students take that course, and that's the feedback I get on again and again and again. I'm mixing faster than ever before, but turning out better work than ever before because I have this roadmap. I have this repeatable process. I have this order of operations, and as I get more advanced, I can adapt it more and more to my own personality, my own taste, my own workflow. So just having a clear way of navigating through the mix so you're not just kind of stabbing blindly at things often helps mixes improve significantly before we even get into any little techniques around reverbs and EQs and compressors and all that. All right, let's get on to the next one. Now I promise, with these 10 tips, only two of them are going to have shameless plugs baked into them. And this is the other one that has a shameless plug baked into it. But bear with me because you're going to get some good advice out of it as well. This next one is near and dear to my heart this week because I just released a course all about compression. And this one is that you can't hear compression, number four. Or another way of saying this is that you over-compress or under-compress. And both of these are potentially a problem. Because if you can't hear compression and you're not really confident in setting your compressors, one of two things invariably happens. Sometimes you can't really hear compression yet, so you use too much of it and you ruin your mix through overcompression. Often by using lots of really fast attack compression or limiting that totally smears your transients, make things actually sound kind of smaller and less impressive and just sucks the life out of things. Or you could end up using way too much slow attack compression that actually doesn't give you more dynamic control and ends up making your mixes sound sloppier and in ways more dynamic 
It's not what you expect from compression, but can happen if you don't know what you're doing. You can get more dynamic, more sloppy in ways that you're not expecting. So you can overcompress. Now, you've probably heard the advice so many times, don't overcompress, you'll ruin your mixes that way. So many starting mixers ruin their mixes by overcompressing. So the reality that I encounter is that a lot of you know, new mixers or producers starting to take this stuff seriously is that their problem is not overcompression. It's undercompression. They're so afraid of their compressors. They lack so much confidence in setting their compressors that they just never use enough of it. And that's one of the reasons their records don't sound like their favorite records. Because if you listen to a lot of modern commercial releases, and I'm not just talking about over-compressed, hyper-loud, trying to win the loudness war ones, even just, just good-sounding records, the sound of compression and limiting, tastefully used, is part of the sound of really all modern records. And by modern records, I don't mean the current year. I mean going back decades. Yes, people were using compressors in the 1970s, in the 1960s, in the 1950s. It's not just today. And there's so many different styles of compressor that can change the shape and tone of your mix. And you really got to get confident learning to hear it and use it if you want your mixes to live up to the standard that you expect. And that could be one of the things that's separating you. So does this tie into a shameless plug for my new course, Compression Breakthroughs? Absolutely. Why? Because I made the course and made it almost 10 hours long because I know that it's absolutely going to change the way that people mix forever for the better if they go through it. So if this is a problem for you, check that out at compressionbreakthroughs.com and you'll learn everything that I know about compression and start to really learn to hear it and use it with confidence. All right. Next one that does not include a shameless plug is number five. You try to make everything sound impressive. Now, this is particularly a problem if you're mixing in solo a lot and you get into this place where you're trying to make everything sound good by itself. But this doesn't only happen to people who are mixing in solo a lot. And by solo, I mean you solo your kick drum, you try to make that sound as impressive as possible. Now you move on to your snare drum, you try to make that sound as impressive as possible. Now you move on to your overheads, you try to make those sound as impressive as possible. You move on to your bass, you try to make it sound as impressive as possible in solo. You solo your guitar, try to make that sound as impressive as possible. And you put them all together and it's just a jumble. It's just a mess. Everything's stepping all over everything else. Nothing sounds good. Now, I'm not going to say, never, ever do anything in solo. Like, you can once you're experienced enough, like, or just to like check problems. Like, there's reasons you might EQ something or adjust something in solo. I'm not saying never do it. But if you rely too much on processing each thing in solo where you can really hear the changes, the chances of you making bad choices that don't work in the context of the mix go up dramatically. So that's a reason that people often recommend don't mix in solo too much. But it's not just mixing in solo. It's this whole mindset, this whole idea that everything is supposed to be impressive in your mix. And the reality is that that's not the case. Your job as a mixer is very different from that. It's really to figure out what's most important in the mix. What elements in this moment right now are going to give the most emotional impact to the end listener? What should be featured and what should play a more supporting role right now in this moment? And this might change throughout your mix. It might be different for your verse than in, in your chorus. And it might actually be different in bar eight of your chorus than in bar one of your chorus. Now, this ties really nicely into reason number six that your mix might suck, and that's that you try to make everything be heard equally well at all times. This is kind of related to the last one, but a little different. This idea that, oh, it's my job as a mixer to make everything fit together like these perfect puzzle pieces so you can hear them all clearly. And right now, at this moment, you're going to hear the kick drum and the bass and the snare drum and uh, guitar part number one, and guitar part number two, and the keyboard part, and the background vocals, and that uh, ear candy synth stuff, and the high percussion over there, and the lead vocal, and you're going to be able to hear every detail and every one. They're going to be perfectly balanced, so you can focus on any which one you want. That's bad mixing, I'm sorry, in my humble opinion. And sometimes you find that in a great mix, 
let's even just talk about kick and bass. In a great mix, man, you can hear the kick and the bass because they each occupy their own space and they're each doing their own thing. Maybe the bass is kind of busy and it's kind of tight and the kick drum is this big fat thing that's sitting under it and they don't get into each other's way and you can really hear the intricacies of both at the same time. That can potentially be a good aspect of a mix. But there's also amazing mixes where you're like, mmm, ah, that bass, it sounds nasty, that's great, oh, that bass line, it's really moving me. And then if you stop for a second and say, what does the kick drum sound like? You might be like, oh, you know what, I can't really hear it. But damn, that bass is gnarly. And part of what makes the bass sound so gnarly is you're taking away things that could distract from it. Because right now, the bass is more important than the kick. In this particular arrangement, in this particular song, in this particular section, this particular moment, you don't always have to make everything equally audible at all times. In fact, there are some mixes where you want your bass and kick both to be audible, but there are some mixes where it's like, they don't matter that much, actually. It's really much more about what the guitars are doing right now, or it's much more about those ghost notes on that snare drum, or it's much more about that vocal. Like, are you brave enough to say, this is the thing that's going to like move people's butts and get them out of their chairs, or this is the thing that's going to tug at the heartstrings and like make a little bit of tear come out or a little bit of the, the, the hairs in the back of the neck stand up, that you're saying some things are more important than others, and it's my job to decide and to help shepherd the listener's attention in that direction. And when you start thinking more like that and less like everything has to be heard clearly at all times because that was what mixing is about, your mixes are going to suck less. And even if your mix still sucks, it'll probably be better than it would have been or at least be cool and interesting. And it's better that you have a sucky mix that's cool and interesting than a sucky mix that isn't. So chew on that. All right, next one. Get a little ranty on this one. This is this is really I'm I'm feeling this one. Let's get to the next one. Number seven. Can you believe we've made it that far together? You don't know how to use effects, especially reverb and delay. And one of the big things here with setting reverbs and delay is the most common mistake I hear on mixes that kind of suck a little bit is that people don't EQ the reverbs and delays. Like they just use a full bandwidth reverb that has full low end extension and full high frequency extension. And it kind of sticks out like a sore thumb in their mix. I would say in probably close to 90% of cases, you're going to want your returns on your reverb and or delays to be EQ'd, probably to get rid of some top end. Maybe in some cases you are super bright and you're probably getting rid of some low end instead, or maybe you're getting rid of some of both and making them a little more mid-rangey, but mid-rangey in the right area. Also, if you're using a reverb, like, are you really thinking about how to use your pre-delay? I think I have a whole podcast episode where we talk a lot about pre-delay and a lot about EQing reverbs. These are the two most common things people leave out on reverbs and don't always do right. But similar things happen with delays, delay times, number of delay repeats, whether or not you're EQing them or treating them on the way back or treating them on the way in, EQing your reverb or delay send. We could do a whole episode just about that idea. But also not knowing or understanding like the different flavors, the different Crayola colors in the crayon box of different types of reverbs or different types of delays and identifying when a plate is appropriate versus a hall versus a chamber, what each of those are good for. Can you close your eyes and distinguish a plate from a chamber, from a hall, from a church, and so on? And can you do that still if you actually match their reverb decay time so they're all the same length? And this is probably fodder for a future course. You let me know in the comments down below if you've liked mixing breakthroughs or mastering demystified or compression breakthroughs, what my next full-length course should be. I'm thinking about doing more processor courses. So anything you want to learn about, let me know down below. But I think this is fertile ground for a future one. All right, next one, not automating enough. This is a huge one that I see come up so much in the mixes of people who feel like they're really getting to a place where they're Things are starting to fit together. Their mixes are starting to get better, but they're just not where they want them to be yet. And I'll often ask them about their automation, what they're automating. Or if I'm doing a mix coaching session or I'm doing a master for them, I'll kind of know the answer before I even ask it, which is, did you automate that vocal? 
did you automate those hi-hats? Did you automate that guitar? Like there'll be something that is really at an appropriate level in one section, but isn't at an appropriate level as the mix continues on through time. I will say that in like 98, maybe 99% of cases, you probably want to automate at least your lead vocal. Now, automation can happen in two places. Automation can happen before all of your inserts, like at the waveform level. There's something in Pro Tools, which is the DAW I use most often for multi-track audio, which is called clip gain, that lets you kind of increase or decrease the visual size of the waveform. And doing that can be cool as a part of your overall gain staging and dynamic control strategy, making sure you're getting more consistent results out of your compressor or limiter. But even if you do that, and even if you do a lot of compression and or limiting to a vocal, after all of that, in your final passes of the mix, you probably want to focus on volume automation. And this is a key part of the system that I recommend in mixing breakthroughs. And I kind of give you an order of operations, a roadmap to mixing. It really does help improve the results of everyone I know who's tried it. And automation is an important part of really the final touches on a mix. But it's not just things like lead vocals. It can be background vocals. It can be entire drum kits. It could be your bass line. You could, in some cases, end up automating EQs. If you want your mixes to sound really interesting, doing a little bit of automation on things like effects, delay throws, reverbs, that kind of stuff is crucial for adding interest and helping people follow the narrative arc of the song throughout the mix. So definitely think about that, automating more. Number nine here and number 10 are closely related. Number nine is that you're afraid to make bold choices. And this relates to some of the earlier ones that we talked about. The idea of knowing what's really important right now in the mix and knowing what are the things that should be changed significantly or should be featured significantly and just going proudly and confidently towards doing that. Just saying there are times to be bold and that a great mix isn't all about like the thousands of little choices we make and each one is pretty tiny, but they all add up over time. Yes, that's a component of mixing. That's like the 80% of mixing that you do that gives you 20% of your results in refining things. But the 20% of mixing that you do that gives you like 80% of your impact are a few of these bold choices. And there don't have to be a ton of them. There could be one, two, or three bold choices that you make in an entire mix that dramatically change the emotional impact and or impressiveness of that mix. Maybe it's a bold choice of, we've got to create a distinctive vocal sound for this lead vocal or for this background vocal. And we really want to do something out of left field that's not there in the production, but it's missing something that would otherwise grab the listener. Let's craft that right now. And let's be bold and try a bunch of different things and we'll put a stamp on it because it needs that. Or it could be something bold along the lines of, you know what, in this song, I don't need to make the bass and kick be heard both equally. This song's really about the bass. Or this sound is really about the guitars more than the drums. And making these level relationship decisions and being bold about them. It could be bold in the way that it's like about muting an element or about just little effect throws, delay throw, reverb throw, that kind of thing. It could be the bold decision to completely mute an instrument from the first half of your second chorus and maybe completely from the first chorus and saying, how do we add emotional impact? Just completely muting things and leaving them out. Or it could be the bold choice of this kick drum or this snare drum it's not going to work and get the client or myself what I want out of this mix. And the only way to really improve this kick or snare is doing sample replacement or sample augmentation. And I'm just going to have to boldly choose a totally different snare sound than what's there, but it's going to make all the difference, even if I touch very little else in the mix. And we're going to have to really replace or just enhance what's there and even if that's one of the only bold choices I make, it's really going to make a difference in how the end mix comes across. But this is related closely to number 10, which is the flip side of the coin, which is that your mix might suck because you never leave anything alone. 
Because just as important as it is to make at least one, two, three, maybe more bold choices in a mix, the better the production is, maybe the fewer that you have to make at the mix stage. In addition to those bold choices, you have to know when to leave well enough alone. And it's not your job in mixing a track necessarily to go through every single instrument or even worse, every single track and say, well, got to apply some EQ and compression to this one and do a little bit of a reverb or delay send. Then I'll go to this one and apply a little bit of compression EQ. And you're just going through in this rote way of putting a little bit of sweetening on each track. No, before you touch a single thing, and this is like rule number one of mixing for me, before you touch a single thing, First, ask yourself, what, if anything, needs to change? And if you need to, don't just make a mental note of it. Literally write it down. What, if anything, needs to change? And then laser focus in on those items. And if you really go in and first decide what, if anything, needs to change, what direction does it need to change, and then you change those things, after you've done all that, you may very well come back and look at all the things you haven't touched and say, well, I, I actually, I can leave those alone. I don't have to mess around with them. I don't need to compress or EQ or send to an effect every last little thing in the mix necessarily. It might have been produced well enough that that's not necessary on even a majority of the tracks. And it's just coming down to the significant choices I'm making where it matters. Well, I hope that helps those are the 10 biggest reasons that I've encountered when coaching clients or hearing mixes from my mastering clients or asking for feedback. Those are the 10 most common things that come up that are holding people back. But there's one other thing I want you to consider as well. There is the possibility that your mix doesn't actually suck. You've just been listening to it for too long and you're losing all perspective, and you're second-guessing yourself way too much. And there's a good chance that your mix doesn't suck nearly as much as you think it does. So think about that, and also maybe check out one of our podcast episodes on keeping perspective in a mix, because that's huge. And if you start losing perspective in a mix, and you start going back and second-guessing everything and changing everything when you're halfway through the mix, or you thought you were 90% of the way through the mix, and you're like, oh, I need to go back and change everything. It's terrible. Chances are that you're wrong, and you're just having like an emotional moment because you're a human being, and you need to take a break, and you need to get some distance. Because something that's happened to me on several, several occasions, maybe it's happened to you, is you've done a mix, and near the end of it, you're like, oh man, this sucks. I know there's so many ways it could have been better. And there's so many ways I, I, I failed to make this as good as it could be. And you just hear all the flaws, all the imperfections, all the things you want to improve. But then you stop and you wait like a few months before even listening to this thing again, or maybe even a year, because you don't even want to hear it, because you just think about all the things that you missed. And you listen to this thing like a year or two later, or even a few months later, and you go, oh, wait, that's not that bad at all. Actually, it's pretty good. I mean, maybe I could have brought that one thing up or down a little bit, but hey, <laughs> that's okay. And you got the emotional distance you need, because when you were in mix mode, you were spending so much of that mix mode focusing on what can be improved, what's wrong, what do I make better? And you're just in that state of mind. And that's what's making you think your mix sucks when it, maybe it sucks a little bit, but it doesn't suck nearly as bad as you think it does. And that often occurs. Now that said, I've got to be honest with you. If you're like, you're a few months into mixing and you kind of feel like your mix sucks, it, it probably does to a degree and you are going to have to spend more time to get better at it. But you'd also be surprised. A thing that might happen to you when you get much more advanced and much better at mixing is you've spent years on it and you feel like you're finally firing on all cylinders. And then you hear some damn amateur who's barely been doing this for a year and like, their stuff just sounds really good. <laughs> it's so annoying. It's so annoying. But it does happen. And often those are people who are producing and arranging things themselves, and they're not afraid to make some of these bold choices, and they just haven't heard enough bad advice yet, and they're just naturally doing some of the things that we're talking about right now. So you need to figure out a way to get back there. 
And I think by focusing in on these 10 problems that helps you get some of the youthful naivete and creativity back into your mixing by focusing on these specific problems. That said, there are probably chops that you should and could improve. And there are probably strategies you can adopt to make your mixes happen way quicker. So even if they're already good, you can probably get way more efficient at making them good, which leads to less second guessing, less hating your own mixes, less hating yourself, less questioning what you're doing. And honestly, since you're spending less time in your mixes, probably better results and better sounding mixes. If you do need help in improving your skills, which in my opinion, way more important than improving your gear and arguably more important than even improving your monitoring, which I'm a bigger advocate of. If if you do want to improve chops on compressing, on your mixing workflows, on really knowing what you're doing in mastering, then check out one of my full-length courses like Compression Breakthroughs. This is one of the things you really got to get a handle on if you want to mix really well and not overdo it or just as bad underdo it and really do it with creativity and confidence. Check that out at compressionbreakthroughs.com with a 30-day money-back guarantee. But even more pertinent to today's topic, mixing breakthroughs. Oh man, it is a whole system for mixing that will get you into the right habits to help you avoid these 10 major problems before they even start occurring in your mixes. It is a strategy. It is a roadmap to mixing, a repeatable process that you can implement, but then adapt to your own personality and style. And it is going to change the way that you mix forever for the better. Your finishing rate is going to go way up. Your creativity and your confidence is going to go way up. While your time to complete mixes goes way down, while your quality goes up. Is all that possible at once? Absolutely. Thousands of students have taken this course, and we've got tons of testimonials to the effect of just how much it has changed people's lives and changed the way they mix. I 100% believe in it, and that's why you get a 30-day money-back guarantee on it. Check that out at mixingbreakthroughs.com. Or if you want to learn everything that I know about mastering, check that out over at masteringdemystified.com. Last, certainly not least, I want to hit you to a couple of discounts and deals we've got from some of our brand sponsors. I want to mention GPU Audio again, because this one's really interesting sponsoring the podcast this week. These guys are taking not just the CPU that's in your computer, but your GPU, the graphics processing unit that unless you're doing like hardcore gaming or hardcore video work or hardcore cryptocurrency mining, you're probably really not using much of at all when you're in there in your DAW making music. It is an untapped resource, but it's actually a resource, this GPU of yours, that's extremely potentially powerful for adding processing power, really low latency, but very powerful effects. And you can try out early access, the new convolution reverb these guys have going absolutely for free. Just go to gpu.audio slash sonic scoop. That's gpu.audio slash sonic scoop to get early access for free to their GPU based convolution reverb. You're definitely going to want to check this out. It is so close to having no latency so powerful, and really good sounding impulse responses in there as well. Check it out. Also, if you want to check out some of my other favorite plugin brands that I use all the time, Isotope, you can get a 10% discount on any plugin they make over at isotope.com slash sonic scoop. I use some of their ozone modules on practically every master I do. You'll find at least one or two or three or more of them on practically every master that I do. I love their stereo imager, their dynamic EQ, their maximizer, so much great stuff in there. Also, the RX noise reduction suite is wonderful. I've even mixed an entire track using nothing but their music production suite pro bundle, and you can find that on this very channel. If you want a 30-day free trial to that music production suite bundle instead of the usual seven-day free trial, go to that same link, isotope.com slash sonic scoop. That's isotope.com slash sonic scoop. And finally, one of my favorite companies around for creative mixing effects, it is Sound Toys. You can try out any of their super cool, super fun, super creative mixing effects totally for free for 30 days over at soundtoys.com. 
You are going to fall in love with this stuff. If you don't have the Sound Toys 5 bundle already, you should just go ahead and get it because I know you're going to love working with these tools in practically every MixCon presentation we put on with some of the biggest, best major mixers on the planet working today. You're always going to find at least one or two or three or more Sound Toys plugins on practically all of their mixes. So check them out over at soundtoys.com. Thanks again for hanging out with me for this week's episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. See you next time.